Uh, Yuma, welcome and thank you all for joining us in person and online this morning. Uh, Minister, Secretaries, Major General, Commissioner, colleagues from across the university and from the Australian Public Service, it's wonderful to have you all here at the Crawford School of Public Policy today. My name is Professor Janino Flynn and I'm the Director of the ANU Crawford School of Public Policy, the leading policy school in this region. I'd like to start today by acknowledging and celebrating the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my deep respects to First Nations people, their elders past and present. This place where we're meeting Canberra is a very special place. Here on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri, across the millennia, stories of the past, the present and the future have been shared and wisdom and knowledge have developed. And today we come together to continue in that spirit sharing stories and building wisdom. It's my immense privilege to host Senator the Honourable Katie Gallagher, Minister for Finance, Minister for Women and Minister for the Public Service, here at the Crawford School as she delivers her annual statement on APS reform. Of course, we're delighted to have the Minister return to the ANU campus because she is, of course, an esteemed alumna of this university. And we appreciate her ongoing relationship with the ANU and her engagement across a range of areas. I must also deliver a personal apology from the Vice-Chancellor who's unable to be with us today. The Minister's ambitions for reform across the Australian Public Service are wide-ranging and seek to reshape both the foundations of the Public Service as well as position it for the future. In articulating these ambitions last year, the Minister has set the scene for a once-in-a-generation reform of one of our most important institutions. Today we'll hear more on the progress towards those ambitions. As a scholar of public sector reform, it is an immense privilege for me to host the Minister today. Having spent the best part of 25 years exploring the dynamics and patterns of public sector reform, the success and the failures, it's true to say that at this time, Australia is at the forefront of transformative change in public sector reform. The focus on restoring trust, reinforcing core principles and values, putting people and business at the centre and building an APS that has the capability to do its job puts us in the spotlight around the world once again. Practitioners and scholars around the world will have a keen eye on developments here over the coming years. Minister, like others here, I look forward to hearing more in your address today about progress towards those bold ambitions. To begin today's event, though, I'm honoured to introduce Ms Selena Walker, Ngunnawal Elder. Following in the footsteps of her grandmother, Auntie Agnes Shea, Selena continues a long legacy of leadership and advocacy. She is the co-chair of the ACT Reconciliation Council and a member of the ACT Victim of Crime and Justice Committee. In 2017, she was recognised as ACT Mother of the Year. I'm also delighted to say that on Monday, Selena was recognised by the ACT government for her commitment to reconciliation and driving change, being named the ACT Local Hero for 2024. I now invite her to welcome us to this country, after which the Minister will deliver her address. Thank you, Selena. Thank you. Yuma, Galaganya Jolina Woga, Darawa Nona Darawa Nunawu. Hello, my name is Selena Walker, and this is Nunawu Country. I'd like to first start by acknowledging my elders, the Nunawu elders, and pay respect to my elders, past, present, and future. I'd also like to acknowledge the recent passing of my grandmother, Aunty Agnes Shea. I want to acknowledge any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are with us in the room today, but also online. Welcome, my brothers, sisters, aunts and uncles. And I'd like to extend that to all of our non-Indigenous friends that have joined us, welcome. I'd also make mention of Senator Gallagher, who has been a good friend to my grandmother and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community here for a long time. The Ngunnawal community are the traditional custodians of Canberra and the region. You may not be aware that the Ngunnawal Nation is made up of several family groups and not just individuals who represent this country. Therefore, as a community, we have an elected body known as the United Ngunnawal Elders Council to represent us, along with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elected body of the ACT. It is important for you to understand and acknowledge for our identity is a collective identity. There are other Indigenous and non-Indigenous people from around the country, the nation and the world who have come to live on Ngunnawal land. I'd like to acknowledge and welcome you all. The tradition of welcoming the people to country is a practice that was handed down by our ancestors, old people and elders from the beginning of time. Before entering another person's country, you would first announce your arrival. 
and not enter until the traditional owner formally welcomed you. The reason for this practice was to protect your spirit whilst another person's country and also to show respect for the country which you were entering. It's wonderful to see that this practice is now recognised and respected. I suppose it's not like entering into someone's home unless you're first invited. The Ngunnawal people, as within all Aboriginal people, have a great heritage that would like to share with all Australians from every walk of life. As you are aware, Canberra means meeting place. And Canberra has been a place of gathering for many Aboriginal tribes of Australia to come together to deal with important business and also for ceremonial purposes. Our Ngunnawal ancestors believed in the importance of people gathering to build relationships, share knowledge and to celebrate the gift of heritage and history. We believe it's important for all to recognise our unique history and again, an understanding that our land is our heritage and how loss of the land has disconnected so many Aboriginal people from their spiritual links, cultural heritage and identity. Reconciliation is not just a word, it is an action and it's a human rights movement. As an Aboriginal person in this country, I've only been counted as a human being for 56 years. Let me repeat that while that sinks in. I, as a beautiful black woman in Australia, have only been counted as a human being for 56 years. I'm only 42. We are very young in our reconciliation journey here in Australia, but we're on the right path. By incorporating proper cultural protocols like welcome to country, smoking ceremonies, etc., we are on the road to true reconciliation. It does hurt me, though, that my dad was born a tree, that my grandmother was a mother before she was a human being. So I ask you all to take a moment and think about how old you are, how old your children are and how old your elders are and what you are doing to contribute to that reconciliation human rights movement. The vote in the referendum that just went through was not the result that we wanted, but it was another big milestone in our reconciliation journey. Those conversations need to continue for this country to progress to true reconciliation. So I encourage you all to continue those conversations, that discussion. I'm so proud to be a Canberran and I'm so proud of my fellow Canberrians for getting the yes vote here. It's a true demonstration that the work that my grandmother done towards reconciliation that I'm now continuing is actually influencing change. So if it can happen here, it can happen anywhere. And I have a vision that this country will move to true reconciliation. So thank you once again for inviting me here to do the Welcome to Country. I unfortunately can't stay for the rest of the event, um, mostly because I'm a ring and I don't really know what this is about, but um, I do have my 15-year-old here <laughs> who I have to get off to school. Um, so thank you once again. Um, well done to the work that you're doing. I know APS is obviously the Australian Public Service and reform is always a good thing, so whilst I'm not over it all, um, well done for the work that you're doing here. Congratulations to the organisers. And I'll now finish in the words of my people, the Ngunnawal people. Yumalandi Yananga Yerubu Yangu, which means you may leave footprints on our land now. Or in other words, welcome to country. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Selena, who has just departed for Welcoming Us to Country. Um, her grandmother, Ani Agnes, was a remarkable Canberran and I was very fortunate um, to, uh, to know her and to learn from her and to take her advice. Um, and she's, she's left a big hole, I think, in our fabric, our social fabric here, but um, I can see from Selena and her family that... Uh, her grandmother would be very proud of her achievements to date. I would also like to begin by paying respect to the ancient Ngunnawal people upon whose land we gather this morning. I thank them for their custodianship and for their care of this beautiful country and I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders joining us today. I acknowledge Professor Janine O'Flynn and the staff of the Crawford School. Thank you very much for having me here. I'd also like to acknowledge other guests here today. I see my friend and colleague, Alicia Payne, the member for Canberra. Thank you for coming. Uh, to the Secretary of the APS, um, Glyn Davis, 
to the APS Commissioner, um, Dr uh, Gordon Brower, Secretary Jenny Wilkinson, who I see here, other secretaries, leaders of the APS, APS staff and other interested yes. people um, who are joining today. Before the 2022 election, the now Prime Minister promised to invest in and rebuild the Australian Public Service. From opposition, we had witnessed up close the impact of almost a decade of eroding and devaluing the APS. And we knew there was a big job ahead of us if we formed government following the election in May last year. Throughout the campaign, we argued the merits of build, building a stronger public service that delivers better outcomes for the community, delivers frank and fearless advice to government, acts as a model employer, and through its policy work and delivery of programs, contributes to building a fairer and more inclusive Australia. We recognise that the public service is an enduring institution central to the strength and success of our proud democracy. While it's not the election policy that will garner much attention in the heat of the battle, under Anthony Albanese's leadership, we were open and upfront that we thought the APS needed reform for it to be able to do the job we needed it to do. So in addition to our commitment to a National Anti-Corruption Commission, we also committed to begin this work by abolishing the ASL cap, which had distorted the shape of the APS workforce, completing a government spending audit, improving pay conditions and fragmentation of APS employees, undertaking the audit of employment, reducing the reliance on consultants and contractors, and converting insecure and expensive external labour arrangements into good permanent jobs where it was appropriate. 18 months in and we have done all of these things, but there is much more to do. Around this time last year, I had the opportunity to deliver the first speech outlining our agenda for reform of the APS. We placed integrity and trust at the centre of this agenda. A public service that is trusted by Australians and that operates with integrity. We set about rebuilding the service to restore capacity and capability outlining the reforms needed to ensure lasting change with a secretary appointment responsible for APS reform. I acknowledge uh, the APS commissioner today, the APS reform team and staff from the APSC who are here today and those who aren't, uh, this work would be impossible without their support. They've responded so enthusiastically to our reform agenda and who are now shaping it going forward. Some of the most urgent work in the early days was to get across the extent of the underfunding and funding cliffs which existed across the budget um, and addressing those, whether it be a greater investment in Services Australia, Veterans Affairs, Aged Care, Health, NDIS or money to stop the roof from falling off our national cultural institutions and keeping Australia's biosecurity system operating. And we have dealt with these. Twelve months ago, we also announced our foundational priorities or pillars for public service reform. To refresh your memories, there are four pillars for which our reform agenda aligns. They are an APS that embodies integrity in all that it does, an APS that puts people and business at the centre of policy and services, an APS that is a model employer, and an APS that has the capability to do the job well. Under the first stage of the reform work, all of our projects have aligned with these four pillars and that will continue under stage two, which will be the focus of my remarks this morning. Stage one was to design a reform agenda that has integrity and trust at its foundation. We are now entering stage two, which is implementing the reforms and embedding them across the APS. This includes moving the APS reform office into the Australian Public Service Commission. So that reform and continued improvement is baked into the public service itself considered business as usual and is not just seen as a one-off. And before getting into the new areas reform, I want to take this opportunity to say that the APS is an outstanding institution of which we should be very proud. It is full of incredible leaders at every classification level. From those who have dedicated their entire careers to public service to those who have recently joined, spurred on by the prospect of working on some of the biggest challenges facing the country. <coughs> I met yesterday with the Finance Department graduates, a seriously impressive bunch of young people embarking on their careers, exactly the sort of talent that we need to attract to the APS. And as I have travelled around workplaces and talked with APS employees, or like Senate Estimates, when I appeared with public servants for over 40 hours, people are proud of their work. They're dedicated to delivering the outcomes their agency is responsible for and they are incredibly professional in the discharge of their duties. 
So there is a lot of good work going on supporting a very busy government, often in very difficult circumstances and often within a constrained environment. But it is also important to admit that there are areas that need to improve and areas where we need to implement further reforms to strengthen the APS. The government recognises the public service has come under heavy scrutiny over the past 15 months with the Robo Debt Royal Commission, various code of conduct inquiries, audit reports, ombudsman's inquiries, the PWS, PwC scandal and the associated focus on contracting across the APS. These reports and various recommendations show that there is more work to do to strengthen the trust, integrity and independence and capability across the APS. And I don't make these comments to apportion blame or shift the focus, but I do believe that honest assessments help drive the improvements and accountability needed going forward. So under that first priority area for us, an APS that embodies integrity in everything it does, a year ago we put this firmly at the centre of our APS reform agenda. We want an APS that embodies integrity in everything it does. Whilst establishing the Nanti National Anti-Corruption Commission or implementing set the standard recommendations in Parliament attracted a lot of attention, what perhaps attracted fewer headlines but is equally as important is the reform work underway to strengthen the integrity of the APS at all levels of the service. We have made the expectations of senior executives in the APS clearer and stronger. We announced the intention to include behaviours as well as outcomes in SES performance reviews with a framework recently signed off by secretaries. This framework will ensure that our most senior APS leaders serve by example. They will lead by strengthening the behaviour in their respective agencies. We know that good culture driven from the top delivers better results, better outcomes for government and ultimately optimal outcomes for Australians. Leadership matters in the APS and the SES are key to driving positive culture across their workplaces, and I know how seriously they take this responsibility. We have also introduced legislation to strengthen the Public Service Act, which includes enshrining the value of stewardship across the APS. This legislation makes it clear that ministers cannot direct an agency head on employment matters and entrenches in law agency capability reviews. We're improving transparency through releasing the APS employee census results publicly, along with action plans to respond to the results. Today is the next stage of APS reforms under this first pillar. We will introduce reforms to the appointments process and performance management of senior public servants. These changes create an enduring framework that strengthens the employment, merit and integrity framework of the APS going forward. The next phase of APS reforms will include a requirement the PMNC Secretary and the APS Commissioner conduct merit-based appointments processes for secretary roles to build rigour into the advice provided to the Prime Minister on candidates. We'll also publish a secretary's performance framework and process and put in place better handling of sustained underperformance of secretaries, including appropriate consequences. As well as this, we will improve transparency and consistency in how agency head appointments, performance and suspension for executive statutory and non-statutory agencies are conducted, including having merit-based appointment processes and creating a power to suspend agency heads, including without pay, and applying sanctions following breaches of the code of conduct by agency heads for executive statutory and non-statutory agencies. While there will be a separate detailed government response to the specific matters raised in the Robo Debt Royal Commission, our reforms in the APS space will provide for new own motion powers for the APS Commissioner to in initiate reviews and investigations into code of conduct breaches by current and former agency heads, including secretaries and APS employees. New powers for the APS Commissioner to inquire into code of conduct breaches by former agency heads, including secretaries, to match the existing powers to investigate current agency heads. And thirdly, build safeguards into the APS Commissioner's appointment process to complement the expansion of their own motion and inquiry powers. This work will also complement the work already underway by the APS Integrity Task Force and the Linnell Briggs Review of Public Sector Board Appointment Processes, which is currently before government. Under our second priority area, an APS that puts people and business at the centre of policy and services, 
the uh, second area of the government's reform agenda was a commitment really to invest in the APS that put, and, and put that focus on people and business. The APS has a new charter of partnerships and engagement that makes it clear on the commitment to genuinely partner and engage with all people, communities, non-government sector, academia and industry. This new charter highlights the importance of being open and responsive, transparent and accountable, informed and collaborative. This type of genuine partnership is already happening in several initiatives, such as the Connected Beginnings Program being jointly run by the Department of Education and Department of Health and Aged Care. It draws on the knowledge of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to improve access to existing early childhood, maternal and child health and family support services so children are ready to thrive at school by the age of five. Connected Beginnings is community owned and led. This means that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have a say in how activities funded by the grant are delivered to their people in their own places and on their country. One of the other areas is in data and digital policy. Now, digital ID is a great example of putting people at the centre of policy and services, and it's one of our priorities under the data and digital government strategy. In developing this strategy, the government heard from members of the public, the community sector and business to formulate a vision of a simple, secure and connected services. The message from our consultation process was that government must provide inclusive, accessible services with a focus on security and trust. Digital ID is designed with the Australian people front of mind. It will protect citizens' identity and make it easier to engage with government and other services and cut down on paperwork and personal admin. We are working through the feedback from the consultations on the draft legislation, but the entire project is focused on how to make life easier and safer for people to engage with governments at every level. Now, one of the main challenges, but also one of the main opportunities facing government is the speed with which technology is moving and how to respond and seize some of the opportunities that come with this time. Earlier this year, we kicked off the first long-term insights briefing, which was a commitment from the first phase of reform. In putting together these briefings, PMNC has engaged with community representatives as well as subject matter experts, reporting back to the APS about what the future challenges lie ahead and the readiness of people to face those challenges and how policy may be developed to meet them. The very first insight briefing was on how might artificial intelligence affect the trustworthiness of public service delivery. It was released last week on the PMNC website and is a resource for relevant agencies that are now engaging actively with AI. The briefing paper details what needs to be considered when using AI in tandem with in-person delivery of services. Empathy and human connection are a crucial aspect of so many parts of APS service delivery. And the uh, Albanese government believes that the role of the public service, and this is relevant to the insights briefing, is not only to respond to near-term challenges, but to also to think beyond the electoral cycle and prepare for the complex policy challenges that lie ahead. Now, under priority three, which is the APS as a model employer, Investing in the APS will only be worthwhile if people want to work there. And we believe that the APS should be a model employer supported by the government to do so. And that's why if we just look back over the last 12 months or so, we've significantly increased the resourcing to a number of departments that had suffered to the public detriment from the ASL cap in particular. Um, we've converted over 3,000 labour hire and external jobs into permanent jobs. We've agreed on an APS-wide approach to workplace flexibility with secretaries boards endorsing the principles of flexible work in the APS in March this year. We've achieved a milestone of gender parity at the SES 2, band two classification with women comprising 50.1% of this cohort. And women have now reached parity at every level from APS 1 to SES band two. We've reduced the gender pay gap in the APS and have passed legislation to mandate public reporting on it from 2024. We've also commenced the first centralised bargaining round since 1995, which I might live to regret, but anyway, we'll <laughs> press on, uh, to progress fair and genuine negotiations between employers, employees and unions, and we do hope to reach agreement soon. We have agreed on more than 50 common conditions across the APS, including a common term on flexible working arrangements. And it, when, when the offer is accepted, we will reduce the pay fragmentation across the APS from an average of 25% to 13% in just this first round. 
Importantly, by the end of the enterprise agreements, all APS agencies will offer 18 weeks parental leave for both parents once the agreements are settled. We do want to attract the best and brightest to the APS, and whilst paying conditions aren't the biggest motivator for a career in the public service, we recognise how an employer treats their employees matters. And as I said, we do hope to finalise the bargaining with unions soon. But as an employer, there are areas where we have to do better. There are gaps that need to be closed. The APS must boost First Nations employment in the APS to reach the established target of 5%. As of the 30th of June, there were just over 6,000 First Nations employees in the APS, an increase of just 49 employees from the previous year. This translates into about 3.5% of the services employees. We need to recruit more than 2,500 new First Nations staff to meet that 5% target. And whilst we need to focus on that and do more to attract and retain First Nations employees, we also need to support more Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander role models as leaders in the SES. Today, we are announcing a new initiative called the SES 100 that aims to increase Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander representation to 100 at SES levels by 2024-25 from the 54 that we have currently. Starting this month, the program will be another step in shifting the dial towards making the APS a model employer and setting expectations needed to drive the change and meet these targets. The fourth and final area is around the APS capability and the capability of the public service to de actually deliver the policies and services that government asks it to do. <laughs> The world would be unrecognisable to the people that established the public service in 1901 when the Attorney General's Defence, External Affairs, Home Affairs, Trade and Customs, the Postmaster General and the Treasury were established. There's quite a good photo of the seven men that headed up that organisation, so it's pleasing to see there's been substantial change in that regard since. But we know that the internal capability of the APS has eroded, over the, particularly over the last 10 years. And one of the main symptoms of that has been the increased reliance on consultants and contractors. We were onto this problem in opposition and we focused on it and we started winding back these arrangements long before PwC became a household name for all the wrong reasons. The audit of employment undertaken by the Department of Finance was really important to get an accurate picture of the state of our public sector workforce. And the results were shocking. 20.8 billion in external labour, the equivalent to a shadow workforce of more than 50,000 people. Whilst the previous government had celebrated its policy of sm so-called small government with its cap on <laughs> ASL numbers, at the same time, external labour costs were clearly ballooning. On average, agencies spend approximately one in every $4 on external labour. That was money that was leaving the APS when in many cases it could have been spent on permanent employees in good jobs across the public service. We've already put in place a number of measures to address this concerning trend, including the conversion of 3,300 roles, which has saved $811 million over the forward estimates. The government has made a commitment to reduce reliance on consultants and contractors by bringing capability back in-house. And on the other side of this is how do we attract and retain people who want to work in the APS? So further work will be done to develop best practice recruitment and selection options across the APS, commit to consistent hiring practices, mandating the sharing of merit lists and strategies to maximise the use of those lists, and enable movement across the service, including a review of mobility mechanisms across the APS. One of the other areas we've focused on has been the establishment of the in-house consulting model. So the pilot um, under the name Australian Government Consulting has started already to deliver on projects including services in project and change management and organisational planning, exactly the type of work previously done by consulting firms. There was a huge amount of interest in this work from outside and inside the APS with over 900 applications for just a handful of positions in the first rollout, which I think demonstrates the level of interest in this type of work. 
It is funded to deliver 10 projects over the next two years as, as it expands. The pilot work has already begun and includes partnering with the Centre for Australia-India Relations in DFAT to develop insights and learn best practice from states and territories on sub-national economic engagement with India and partnering with the Net Zero Economy Agency to help develop and embed an agency vision, conduct, conduct strategic business planning and implement robust project management. This is work that would almost definitely have been given to consultants. Complementing this function is the newly established Australian Centre for Evaluation, which has been championed and led by my colleague, Dr Andrew Lee, supported by $10 million in funding to improve the volume, quality and impact of evaluations across the APS. Its purpose is to lead the APS to integrate high quality evaluation into all aspects of program and policy development. This will support evidence-based policy decisions that deliver better outcomes for all aspects of the APS and the people that they serve. The APS has also just completed its pilots or, uh, th through the work of the APSC primarily, its pilot of future focus capability reviews. There have been four reviews completed with two more to come. And I think it's fair to say the reviews show mixed results. I thank Infrastructure, APSC, Health and Agriculture for stepping up and being the first four to do a capability review. Whilst the reports themselves are important, so is the fact that these reviews will become standard operating practice for the APS going forward with a process that isn't punitive or budget related. Well, Jenny and I are holding firm on that, <laughs> but rather focuses on continuous improvement and open and transparent ways of operating. Common themes in the reviews done to date have emerged around workforce planning, providing connected strategic advice, using data better and technology. But, and more has to be done to build capability in these areas. And that's why last year we announced the APS Capability Reinvestment Fund. This is funding our commitment to rebuild capability through a competitive process where agencies put forward proposals that have sector-wide uh, benefits. This year, the fund supported 10 projects that are building vital capability in the APS, like embedding iterative evaluation methods in policy, and program roles and building expertise in gender analysis, um, which should inform policy development and gender responsive budgeting. The next round of capability investment fund bids are now open and all agencies are encouraged to apply for a share of six and a half million dollars in funding. Priority areas will include issues that are front and centre of the challenges we're grappling with as a country, including enhancing data analytic and policy integration skills, adapting to a green economy workforce, building understanding of AI application in the public service, building um, capability for working in Asia and Pacific and supporting cultural and psychological safety in the workplace. While the publicity around PwC has been everywhere this year, before this story broke, we were working on an important policy framework around the roles and functions in Commonwealth entities that should be delivered by APS employees. And last week we released the new APS strategic commissioning framework. This framework aims to strengthen APS capability through reduced reliance on contractors and consultants. Core functions such as drafting cabinet submissions, drafting regulation, leading policy development or occupying a role on an agency's executive must never be outsourced. Agency heads should be accountable for rebalancing their workforce to prioritise direct employment strengthen capability and ensure any use of external expertise enhances the work and knowledge of the APS. The strategic commissioning framework sets this policy direction for the APS and provides the advice and tools required for agencies to make this change. This framework outlines the limited circumstances in which external workforce could be appropriate and ensures the APS maximises the benefits of those external or those or any external arrangements. Over time, when supported by APS recruitment, skilling and mobility, this approach will deepen system-wide capability and reduce the risks to integrity, expertise and public trust posed by excessive outsourcing. Monitoring and reporting arrangements will hold agencies accountable for their progress and agency heads must set targets by June 2024 to reduce their, their agency's reliance on contracting and outline what will be bought back in-house how many roles will be affected and the anticipated reduction in expenditure. Targets will be reported in each agency's corporate plan from 2024 to 25. 
and updates on this against updates on progress against those targets will be reported in the agency's annual report and it will also be reported in the APS agency survey. The APS commissioner will provide me with an annual update drawing on agency reporting and progress which will be published on the APSC website. Now, in conclusion, you're probably saying, thank goodness. Um, I don't often give very long speeches, so you have to just bear with me. We recognise after years of attacks on the APS where small government resulted in a diminished service, where jobs were outsourced, where deep history and knowledge was ignored or eroded, that we needed to do things differently. Now, there have been a lot of opinion pieces and calls for faster change and a focus on permanently enshrining more reform elements in a legislative reform package. I've read those pieces and I always listen to those voices with respect. There is always more that can be done, but not everything can be done at once. And it is equally important to do things well and to deliver on the promises we've made. The reforms we've already implemented, the ones that are underway and the ones I've announced today, I believe demonstrate the seriousness and commitment we have to rebuilding and permanently protecting the APS so that it is able to perform the job it needs to do on behalf of all Australians. This is a journey that requires the APS and the government to work together to rebuild the culture of frank and fearless advice, integrity and stewardship. Everyone who wants to play a role in that has a role to play. And I acknowledge the public service today. I thank them for their work serving the Australian people and I thank them for their openness and willingness to make the great 123-year-old Australian public service even better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister, and if it's okay with you, I might take the privilege of the chair to ask mm-hmm. you a question. Um, one of the things that you ended on was really a story of progress and time, and, and we think about the sort of dynamics of public sector reform um, over the many decades, we often forget a critical ingredient of reform, which is time and sometimes a little patience. And there is always calls for change to be very quick and to address all of those challenges um, at once. But we do know that the story of Australian reform has really been about radical incrementalism. Um, But if we look back in time, it's something very different to what it was. But that change has really been focused on always um, progress and continuous improvement. There's huge demands in a reform project of this scale. So I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on this idea of time and and patience. You ended a little bit on it today. Yeah, thanks very much, Janine. Um, It's it's hard to find the right balance. I think that's the the first part of the answer. Um, And I get the sense, and I, I kind of alluded to it at the conclusion, that there's a lot of people who would like to see a lot of things done faster, Um, but, I've been a minister for a while, in particularly in a different role. And so, you know, having that insight and knowing that the institution of the APS exists on its own, like it it has its own way of operating. And so the changes I've outlined, even the changes we've done in the first year, are big changes. Um, But I think you have to kind of trade off between this kind of short, sharp kind of shock approach, which would be to implement everything in a rush, um, or the path we've taken, which is to identify the areas where we think we can make the most substantial impact and change, the areas where we thought there were issues, and bring people with us as we implement that change. Um, You know, I, I just, I believe it's the right way to do it. To some, they might see it as not ambitious enough, but I I think the agenda we've outlined, both the new reforms we're doing now, the ones we've done, they are significant change. Even the introduction of the National Anti-Corruption Commission is a big change for the public service, Um, you know, and it has sort of flow-on impacts on how you do your work, you know, how how you operate as a public servant. I mean, all of those things, um, you know, it doesn't sound big to people who don't understand who don't have a lot of engagement with the public service, but it is substantial, as is, you know, shifting the way we employ people, as is bargaining with our employees. These are all things that take a lot of effort and a lot of time. And 
I'm trying to look beyond a three-year cycle. Like it would be very attractive to have everything done in three years, believe me, but I don't believe that is the way to drive the long-lasting change that we need to embed it permanently and to protect it, the APS for the long term. It's a longer, it's, it's going to take longer than that. Um, hopefully we'll still be around and seeing it through. Like. <laughs> Happy to do that. <laughs> I'm always welcome you back. To um, I'm going to open the floor for questions, just with a just with a short caveat, which is um, for our friends in the media, we have got separate time for you afterwards. So if we can hold hold those questions, so I can come um, to the audience first, that would be um, wonderful. Um, just stand here, Siobhan. Michael, put them lining up. Thank you. Um, Thank you for your, uh, your statement this morning. I'm particularly interested in the Productivity Commission's review uh, of the National Agreement on Closing the Gap, which showed that there were some critical gaps in terms of the APS's capacity to meet um, and contract with Aboriginal organisations in a whole range of really critical closing the gap areas. So I wonder how that's being considered in terms of APS reform and in particular the capacity of APS leadership really to meet um, the needs of what the government's committed to in all those critical areas. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so that's, I mean, that's, I, I, I kind of made a brief mention to um, one of the projects, the Connected Beginnings project that is underway, but I would say, um, you know, Linda Burney as the minister is leading really a, a pretty significant piece of work. Obviously, we had the referendum uh, over the last few months, but running alongside that is is learning new and better ways uh, to engage on the ground with delivery of, of services and supports. And I think the best model that we have that kind of alludes to a new way of doing things is through the Central Australia Plan, which is where... You know, we made, we identified um, some investments that we made, but we didn't take the decisions on how and who was going to be doing that until we had gone through a suitable process of engaging with organisations and communities on the ground, um, which hasn't really necessarily been the, the way that we've engaged across government. I mean, one of the big challenges, I think, from the Commonwealth is we are quite removed, in my experience, from... <coughs> The local delivery of what's and need of what's happening on the ground, and I see that because I was the chief minister here, where we were a lot closer, where we formed those council and, and local government functions. Um, you know that is a challenge for the Commonwealth, uh, and it has implications on how uh, I think on on how we do our work at that level. So I, I mean, we are putting the referendum aside. One of the very clear messages, I think, out of that, if, you, if you're looking for some of the positives that came out of that, is this renewed focus and understanding of gaps that exist and an expectation that government is doing something to close those gaps. Um, and so I think there's a lot more that we have to do. Uh, we have to be a lot better about how we're pool, pooling and aligning resources across government. I think it's quite hard. If you said today, how much and where are you all departments across the Commonwealth making investments in closing the gap, um, it would be, it would take a bit of time to answer that question. Um, so I think there's a range of things we have to do. I had a meeting with Linda Burney about it yesterday, about how we can better resource the work she does, because as Minister for Indigenous Affairs, she, she doesn't necessarily have the levers on all of the areas, say education, health, justice, housing, uh, she sometimes has small programs like the remote housing program, but that how that aligns with the broader government's housing agenda is not within her control. So there's, I'm rambling now, but there is, it's before government, and we are actively thinking about it and how we can and how we can do it better. And I think the how we settle that Central Australia plan is going to be critical to thinking about how we can deploy that in other parts of the country. Minister, my first question was about time and I'm looking Sorry. at my... No, 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 don't apologise. I'll be quicker. You can, I'm just conscious also that your team's going to be very uh, keen to get you out. I've got time for only one more. 
So I'm going to go to my colleague, Michael DeFrancesco, um, and then I'll have to close because I've got no worries. your team's got me on the clock. Thanks, Janine. Um, Michael DeFrancesco, I'm an associate professor here in the Crawford School, and for full disclosure, also currently one of the editors of the Australian Journal of Public Administration. Um, thank you very much for your uh, annual statement, uh, Minister, which is itself uh, a significant reform um, and, and much appreciated. Um, I wanted to ask a question, and I do so in all earnestness, um, but to contextualise the question very quickly, um, there's a long-standing notion uh, in understanding uh, public administration uh, and public governance in Westminster systems. Uh, it's, it's called the public service bargain, and it takes a look at the way that there's different distinct roles uh, and also constraints on both the political side, ministers, and also the administrative side, public servants. Um, you set out a whole range of very important uh, reforms, many of which are both structural or um, incentives-based and, 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 and linked, if you like, to building capability and, and improved integrity. Um, the question I ask is, in terms of the bargain, um, how would you envisage the appropriate role of ministers in the way that these changes will operate as they're implemented. Um, and that's in terms both of what you might see as the appropriateness of their role, but also, and I, as I said, I ask this with all earnestness, whether or not there should be constraints placed on ministers in the same way that constraints are placed on public servants. Yeah, well, I think, um this is okay. I'm just trying to think how to navigate that question um, <laughs> openly. Well, all of these changes have been through the cabinet, so I should say that this is um, the prime minister leads a cabinet government that um, you know considers it's not just me coming out or the, with the PM's approval. Um, the cabinet, I think, well, ministers, I think, at times need. Um, and through this work, I hope we're providing it to them, clear delineation on their role and the role of the public service. I don't think that ministers just automatically know that when they take up their uh, commissioning. Um, and so what we're trying to do through this uh, and through, um, I think, the PM and others um, explaining the value, the role, the independence, uh, the enduring nature of the APS as an institution that sits beyond and uh, certainly beyond any electoral term, um, that the institution itself is respected and then there is executive government that has a, has a role and a, re a particular relationship with the APS while we're in those roles. But I think ministers need, you know, they need to, and we, we've tried to do this in the first year, really educate and explain um, what their role is, um, you know, some of it's in this, agen in this um, agenda, so, you know, ministers cannot direct agency heads, for example, on certain matters, those kinds of things. That sets, I think, a permanent framework um, which, which sets the rules, basically. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, I think for me, and watching how ministers engage uh, with their departments, uh, the Prime Minister asks them to get down, get out, meet them all, understand the work they do. Part of it's that, being visible, present, working collegiately, but also knowing the limits. Um, and there are limits and there should be limits. And that's part, again, why we're trying to seek to put a lot of this in either legislation or guidance uh, to ensure that what we've seen when those lines were blurred and they, I think there's an open acceptance that there have been some blurring of those lines in recent times that we are dealing with that in a long-term way. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that's probably the answer I would give to that. There's, there's always more work to be done. There's individual issues you have to manage. But I think if we get the framework right, if ministers are educated and understand their role, you know, if we put in place processes that um, demonstrate good practice, um, that that will be moving very much in the right direction. Thank you, Minister. I think Michael's commissioning a piece for the journal as we <laughs> as we speak on the oldest question of public administration on the role of um, that relationship. I'm very sorry to say this will conclude our Q and A session. Um, I know you're on a very tight schedule.
but it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr Gordon de Brow, the Australian Public Service Commissioner, to provide a vote of thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, and, uh, so I'd like to, to thank you, Minister, for your statement uh, and also for the leadership around public sector reform that, that you, you've demonstrated and you demonstrate and also of your Cabinet colleagues. Uh, I, I would have... Uh, Selena Walker's uh, gone, but I wanted to also acknowledge and thank her for that very, very warm uh, and strong welcome to country. I'd, I'd like to thank uh, you, you, Janine, Professor Janine O'Flynn, uh, and her team for facilitating today's uh, presentation and discussion. I'd like to thank the, the Reform Office as well and, and the Public Service Commission and public servants who've worked on this. I'd also like to thank Secretary colleagues. The, a lot of the material that's come out today has gone through with the leadership and the decision of, of secretaries as well in, in going to the minister and to cabinet. And, and I really thank my colleagues for the leadership that you show uh, across the service. I'd really, the, the final one, before we before we give applause to, to, to Minister Gallagher, I'd like to thank public servants. The 170,000 of you, you do a fantastic job. Where I, I know with my colleagues, secretary board colleagues, we're really proud uh, of what you do. And we wanted to thank you very much for all you've achieved in supporting and delivering for government and through that really changing the lives of us of, of Australians. So thank you uh, very much for what you do. But please join with me in thanking Minister Gallagher. Final word. Minister. Minister, thank you so much for joining us today and for entrusting the Crawford School to host this important event. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us today, either here in person or online. Um, Minister, before you leave us, I must insist on a very small gift, um, something to remember us by when you're out on your morning run. Of course, as an alumna of the ANU, it's an ANU hoodie. Um, and I'd like you to know that we also gifted one to the Treasurer when he joined us earlier this year um, after the budget. Um, and so there's nothing that makes us prouder at the ANU than to see um, our alumni um, wearing our hoodies and we, we celebrate the opportunity to have you here. Um, so thank you very much. Please join us outside in the foyer now for some tea and coffee um, and a little afternoon bite. But thank you very much for joining us here at the Crawford School today. Thank you. Thank you.